want to continue with what we were talking about yesterday. The Ramak uh, says the interesting Chiddush that uh, the aside of chesed towards another human being comes from your unconditional Ava Hashem. Uh, that the idea is that when you truly, truly love HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you will want to do chesed to other human beings. And that could be understood in two different ways, although they're related. Uh, one way is because the love you have for other human beings is the divine qualities you see within them. So all human love, if it's true love, is love of God. So I love God, so therefore when I see godliness in another person, I will love that person because he contains God within him. That's one idea. Uh, the other idea is maybe a simpler idea, and that is when you love God, you love that which God loves. And therefore God loves his creation, therefore I love creation as well, right? If you love a parent, you have to love their children, even if you don't, even if you don't like the kids so much. But if you know that the, your beloved friends love their children, you will feel a certain love to the children as well. And that's what we discussed yesterday, why we even have rachamim for the Egyptians, because on the seventh day of Pesach, right, we see the world through God's eyes. And God has a love towards everybody that, that when, when even when Rishayim, and now again, it's a little complicated, uh, but you know, one way to try to wrap your head around it, I'll give you a, a very unpleasant, a very, very unpleasant example, but it's an example that unfortunately is very no gay uh, Let's imagine there's a kid who becomes a mass murderer. Now, I don't mean a Hamas because there the parents glorify that, but let's assume a regular American kid uh, kills 20 people in the high school, in a high school or elementary school, whatever it is. Do parents, what, what are the parents feeling towards their son that is a mass murderer? It's a very, very difficult question. And, you know, Baruch Hashem, uh, very few people have to go through that complexity of emotion. Do you, does one love their child even when they've done something utterly and totally horrendous? How does that feel? Like how does a parent relate to a child who became a mass murderer? So the only word we can use really is ambivalence. That's they love their child, but they hate their child. They love their child because of the potential that was there. They hate what the child became. This, to some degree, is how God relates to Rishayim. Even towards the Rishayim, there is a certain love because of the potential that they had. They were made in the image of God as well. God hates them because of what they became and because of what they do. But the hate and the love can exist simultaneously in a state of ambivalence, although ambivalence is really not, not the right word to use about Hashem, but in the sense of these conflicting emotions. And that's the aside of Maisa Yodai Tov in which Hashem commiserates with the Egyptians, even as he must destroy them because of their evil. Right, so this is what, going back to the Ramak, this is the Ramak's idea that when you love God, you will love humanity because in humanity, and you do chesed for them, because in humanity are divine qualities. So I just wanted to finish up that thought um, by elaborating a little bit on the verse, Vayiro Ames Hashem. And it says, and we say this every day in davening, before, right before Az Yashir. In fact, in the Torah, these are the psukim, right before Az Yashir. Vayar Yisrael es hayad hagdola, asher asa Hashem b'Mitzrayim. B'nei Yisrael saw the great hand that God had did to the Egyptians. Vayiru ha'ames Hashem, and they feared Hashem. V'yaminu b'Hashem, and they believed in Hashem. Uva Moshe avdai, and in Moshe his servant. By the way, this is a very interesting pasuk uh, in terms of a contest. You know, it's a well-known idea that in the Haggadah of Pesach, there is no mention, except for one place, there is no mention of Moshe Rabbeinu's name. 
Moshe Rabbeinu's name does not appear in the narrative of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim that's in the Haggadah. In the Chumash, it appears every other Pasuk. But in the Haggadah, Moshe Rabbeinu's name is not mentioned. And the reason it's not mentioned is because Pesach celebrates the idea of Anivul Omalach, that God saved us without emissaries, without Shalichum. So we only want to focus on Hashem. We don't want to focus on any human intermediary. But there is one place only. In fact, when you become fathers and you want to calm your kids down, you can kind of say, you know, you'll give an extra prize, not only for finding the Afikomen, but for being able to find where Moshe Rabbeinu's name is in the Haggadah. And you'll recall, there's a passage towards the end of Magid, which is taken from the Mechilta. It's actually taken from the Mechilta, in which there's a machlokas, how many plagues occurred in Mitzrayim, and how many plagues took place on the Yamsuf. And you'll recall, there are three opinions. One opinion says 10 makos in Mitzrayim, and 50 makos on the Yamsuf. And that's based on the idea that the 10 plagues are called a finger of God. And Yamsuf is Yad Hagdola. So that's where it quotes the Pasuk, right? Um, and therefore, whatever happened in Mitzrayim is five times more on the Yamsuf. Now, the other opinion uh, follows the same mathematical correlation, but simply says each plague in Mitzrayim had four parts. So that makes 40 in Mitzrayim, ergo 200 on the Yamsuf. And Rabbi Akiva tries to show each plague in Mitzrayim had five parts. So that makes 50 in Mitzrayim, and 50 times 5 is going to be 250. But all three are going with the Mahalech, that whatever number you come up with in Mitzrayim is going to be five times more than uh, in the Yamsuf. And that's based on the Pasuk, Vayar Yisrael esayad hagdola asher asa Hashem b'mitzrayim, Vayiru ha'am es Hashem, v'yaminu b'ashem uvamosha avdo, bingo. That is where Moshe Rabbeinu's name is mentioned. That is the only time it's mentioned in the whole Haggadah. And it's not about Moshe Rabbeinu. It's a drasha about Yad versus Etzpa, in which Moshe Rabbeinu's name happens to be mentioned. And I do want to point out that in the Rambam's Haggadah, right, the Rambam at the end of a Sefer, Sefer Zamanim, the Rambam gives you a Nusuch of a Siddur and a Nusuch of the Haggadah. In the Rambam's Nusuch of the Haggadah, that whole passage does not appear at all. That passage is not in, the, uh, in his Haggadah, which means according to the Rambam's Gersa, there was no mention of Meishu Rabbeinu at all. Although, I will say, Rav Avram ben HaRambam says, testifies, the Rambam's only son testifies that his father said it, even though he did not consider it a mandatory part of the Haggadah. It's interesting. The Rambam only had one son. I believe, I believe he did have a daughter. Um, she may have died in his lifetime, uh, but um, he certainly had no other, no other sons. I think he did have one other, one, one daughter. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Why was Moshe's name mentioned in that specific part? Are, are you talking about in the Haggadah or why the Pasuk mentions it? You give me, you give me well, the reason is because you're kind of stuck because the drasha of the Mechilta is based on the fact that the makos are called etzba, the finger of God, and the yamsuf is called the hand of God. So that's how you get the one to five correlation. But it happens to be in that pasuk, Moshe Rabbeinu's name is mentioned. So once you need to bring in that pasuk for that drasha, so you're kind of stuck. Right? You, don't, you don't want to quote half a pasuk. So you quote the whole pasuk and you're given Moshe Rabbeinu's name. By the way, this also explains another interesting feature of the Haggadah. The actual... It's interesting that the parts, parts of the Haggadah that people are most interested in tend to be the lesser important ones. The four sons, you know, people love that. Uh, people can spend hours on talking about the four sons. The four sons is not really part of the story of the Exodus. The four sons is an introduction to the idea that you must tailor the story to the individual personality of your child. It's a hakdama. It, it is a preface to the narrative. Uh, and people are so interested in kind of the preliminary stuff. By the time they get to the narrative, 
Arami Ovilavi, they fall asleep on that. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the part of the Haggadah that interests people the least is the actual story of Yitzhiat Mitzrayim. It's the preliminaries that people are interested in, the Manishtana and all of those things. Maybe because that's earlier in the Seder night or whatever the reason. So people ask a question. The, the story of Yitzhiat Mitzrayim is based on taking four verses that a person recites when he brings Bikurim and amplifying those four verses by bringing in other verses that add detail. That's the structure of it. Now, one might ask a question. Why do you have to go to Deuteronomy? Why do you go to Devorim and talk about Bikurim? Why don't you read Shemos? Read the book of Shemos. Not the book, the first 12 prakim of Shemos that tell you the story of Yitzhiyaz Mitzrayim. You know, instead of explicating somebody who is reciting a, an abbreviated narrative, why don't you go to the original narrative of the Torah itself? One simple answer is, that would have made the Magid much, much, much longer. If you were to actually read the book of Shmos, you'd have to read 12 prakim. And if you want to include Kriyas Yamsa, 14 prakim. So that's pretty long. That's you know, a few hundred psukim. So Chazal looked for an abbreviated uh, narrative. But another reason is this. If the Anshe Knesset Sagdola were determined to de-emphasize Moshe Rabbeinu's role, they couldn't use the primary narratives of Shmos. Because in the primary narratives of Shmos, Moshe Rabbeinu is mentioned in every Pasuk. So they had to look for a description of Yitzhiat Mitzrayim that doesn't mention Moshe's name. That's very hard to find. But in the Parsha of Bikurim, you actually have four verses, very short, that don't mention Moshe Rabbeinu. God took us out of Mitzrayim with a strong hand, etc. And therefore, Chazal B'davka looked for a narrative structure that does not mention Moshe Rabbeinu. But that's a little bit of an aside. But the main point I want to focus on connected to the Torah of Devorah and what we talked about yesterday is, what does it mean they feared God? They had reverence for God. Didn't we explain yesterday that the Makos gave them Yeres Hashem because they see how God is doing miracles to punish evildoers. But Lehepech, the splitting of the Red Sea was a miracle of love, not a miracle of punishment. So why does it say the result of Kriyas Yamsuf is Vayiru Ha'am Es Hashem? It should have said, they loved Hashem. Why did it say they, Kriyas Yamsuf gave them a yira that's more than the Makos? How could that be so? Why does it say, so the emphasis is this. The emphasis is, you have to understand that yira uh, Hashem has many, many levels. The lowest level of yira is literally fear. And this is called by the Rishainim, Yiras Haonesh. Yiras Haonesh. I better behave because if I don't behave properly, there is on some level going to be accountability in this world or the next world. Punishment, Gehenna, that keeps me on the straight and narrow. Now, it's Enochinami. Yiras Haonesh is not emphasized so much today, but it absolutely is a reality of Judaism, and the Torah itself emphasizes. Yiras HaOnesh quite a lot. It talks about all the different things that will happen if you don't keep the Torah. Now it's true that the Rambam says in Hilchus Tshuva, oh, Yiras HaOnesh, that's a low madrega, that's for kids, a righteous person does not serve God out of fear of punishment. That may be true. It may be the lowest level of motivator, but as the Ramban writes, if we had a true Yiras HaOnesh, we would never sin at all. So, Yeras Onish is a very, very, very powerful motivator. Uh, obviously, it, it is the lowest, it is the lowest, but it can, if, if, if a person really had that era, they would never do an Avera Bechlal. If I could tell you a personal story from my, my law school days, in which uh, Yeras Pasir Vizam, it reminds me very much, Rav Yechanan ben Zakai, on his deathbed, told, he gave his students a bracha. He says, may you fear Hashem as much as you fear 
a human being. So they said, that's the bracha you're giving us? We should fear Hashem like a human being? He said, halvai. Because when a person is about to do it, you're about to steal or something, and somebody sees you, you stop. You're afraid that somebody will see you. When it comes to stealing and nobody's around, and the fact that Hashem sees you doesn't bother you so much. So, how have I, we should fear Hashem as much as we fear a human being. When I was in uh, law school, so um, my second year, so, uh, you know, law school, they, you, don't, you don't get tests during the, during the uh, semester. You only get one test at the end. So if you miss class, it's not a big deal, theoretically. You know, there's no mandatory attendance. So I decided, since um, my parents lived in Connecticut, so I decided I would just take uh, off all of the time from Rosh Hashanah till after Sukkot. I just made it a long vacation, and I studied the assignments. Unbeknownst to me, uh, this particular professor was giving assignments that were due at various dates you know, in this. Uh, and uh, when I came back uh, after uh, Simchas Torah uh, to Boston, what happened was I found 30 letters waiting for me that were mailed to my, where, my address. And the letters began, you know, relatively gently, uh, kind of, you know, you missed your assignment, please turn it in within 24 hours. The last letter, which was like a week later, said, um, if you don't respond to this letter within 24 hours, you're, go you're going to initiate expulsion proceedings. Now that was scary. I was scared. I'd get expelled. You know, that, that's a pretty serious, uh, serious thing. So I immediately made myself available, etc. Uh, and I started saying, well, you know, it was a Jewish professor, not religious. I said, well, you know, we have a lot of Jewish holidays, which really was, I mean, I, I was gone from Rosh Hashanah till after Sukkot. So there were plenty of days I could have been. I said, Jewish holidays, you know. So he took a Jewish calendar, show me the holidays. So, so, so you know, so, so whatever it was. Um, so uh, the point was, I had I had Yira, I had Yira Spasar Badam, I had Yira Spasar Badam, and as a result, um, that was my best course in law school. You know, I was so afraid that I really did good. So Yira can be a motivator. You know, Rav Moshe Feinstein. If you ever saw Rav Moshe Feinstein Davin, a picture of Moshe Feinstein Davin, so he didn't shuckle, he didn't move, he was ramrod straight. Even though the minig of most of Klal Yisrael is to move. In fact, there's a makar for moving. The makar for moving or shaking during davening is based on the Pasuk in Tehillim. All of my limbs, all of my bones say to God, who are like you. So that was the notion of moving. I mean, obviously you don't walk around, but I think more actually says Rabbi Akiva's movements were so powerful that in Shemona Esrei, he would start davening in one corner and he wound up at the other corner. That was like involuntary. Uh, but this is the makar of shuckling. By the way, as an aside, the Kuzari gives the craziest makar for shuckling. This is unbelievable. He says, shuckling dates from a time when people were very poor and you had to have a lot of people learn from a single scroll. So let's say you have 10 people and they're looking, this is before printing, they're looking at a safer. So when I bend forward to see, you won't be able to see, so I move back so you could bend forward to see. So it's like, I move here, I move here. That way, everybody gets to share uh, the safer. That's an amazing thing. But the standard reason that's given is not that pragmatic reason. It's call us my sign. And yet, Rav Moshe Feinstein davened ramrod straight. He would bow down when you have to bow down, of course. And then he would be straight, didn't move. And someone asked Rav Moshe, you know, that was not the minag. He came from Russia. That was not the minag in Russia. Ashkenazim, Svardim, Hasidim, Misnagdim, they all move in very, maybe different ways, but they move in various ways. Why does he stand straight? So he said, when he was a Rav in Stalinist Russia, and he was doing all sorts of things under the table. In fact, he built a mikveh by a swimming pool. He turned a swimming pool into a mikveh. He did all sorts of things that were extremely dangerous for Yiddishkeit and the like. And he did it under the table, but at one point he was summoned to go to the KGB. It wasn't called the KGB then, but he was summoned to the secret police. And he realized that, you know, anything could happen. He could be shot. Uh, he could be sent to Siberia for the rest of his life. You know, and he says he was so frightened that he couldn't move. He was paralyzed. So after this experience, Rav Moshe said, how can I have less awe for Hashem 
than I have for the KGB. And if I see that the KGB paralyzed me with fright, so when I dive into Hashem, I have to have that same Yiras HaOnish, so to speak. So that's Yiras HaOnish. We'll call that level one. And although, again, the Rambam says that is the lowest level, but it is a motivator. Basically, actions have consequences. I mean, one needs to know. My actions have consequences. Hashem loves us, to be sure, but it's not a free ride. It's tough love. It's love with accountability. So that's Yira Sa'onesh. Then there's a higher level of Yira, which is not, it's the same word Yira, but it's not so much fear as it is awe and reverence. And that is called Yiras Haromamus, awe of God's greatness. The idea that God is so infinitely great, infinitely powerful. I am in awe, not because I'm afraid he's going to punish me. It's the awe of perfection and greatness. That's a much higher level. That is not the Yiras HaOnesh. That is the Romamus, the Hasaga of the Romamus of Hashem. Now, even in human relationships, we have that idea. So, for example, uh, if the president of the United States or the president of Israel or Queen Elizabeth uh, before she died, maybe even King Charles, you know, and I walk into a room, you're not really afraid they're going to cut off your head. I mean, in the olden days, maybe that's what kings could do. But, you know, uh, they weren't, they're not going to cut off your head. But still, you feel a little bit, you know, tuck in your shirt and, you know, look, uh, be on your best behavior. Because even if you don't like the person, even, you know, uh, there's a certain what's called awe for the office. And that comes from respect. In fact, Chazal say Maseches Brachas, that there's an Indian when a royal king is passing through a town, even non-Jewish king, there's an Indian, I wouldn't say to be Mavatal, too much Torah for it, but there's an Indian to see the royalty. Because that way you'll have a little bit of a picture of what Mashiach will be like. You'll extrapolate from the human king uh, the glory of Mashiach and even the glory of Hashem. So that's a much higher level because there you're not serving God out of fear of punishment. You're serving God out of Romamus, a sense of awe and reverence. So it's a little, again, it's a little difficult because the same Hebrew word is used but I, I don't think the same English translation is appropriate, meaning Yiras HaOnesh is fear of punishment. Yiras HaRomamus is awe and reverence. So you shouldn't translate that type of Yira as fear of God. It's reverence and awe of God. Now, then we have, so that's level two, going up. Level one is Yiras HaOnesh. Level two is Yiras HaRomamus. Level three, we're going up, is Avas Hashem. Ava Hashem is a higher level than Yiras Hashem. In fact, it's a higher level than both Yiras. It's a higher level than Yiras HaOnesh, and it's a higher level than Yiras HaRamimus. Ava is greater than Yira. In fact, the Ramban, a famous Ramban, in Parshas Yisrei, uh, posits, there's a well-known principle in Halacha that if you have a conflict between a positive mitzvah and a negative mitzvah, and the only way you can keep the positive is by violating the negative. The positive is docha. This is called ase docha losasa. That means what? The positive commandment overrides, pushes aside the negative commandment. The most common, there are many examples actually, but most of them don't come up. Uh, the most common example is why you do a bris on Shabbos. Doing a bris, every bris mila is chilul Shabbos. You're causing bleeding. Actually, it's not, it's not, it's not clear. What, what's the malacha? What is the chilul Shabbos of a bris? Uh, is it bleeding? Is it making him a kli? Because now he's a kosher Jew. In Achlok is what the malacha is. But it's clear, one way or the other, circumcision on Shabbos is desecrating Shabbos. And yet, what does the Torah say? When the eighth day of birth is on Shabbos, you do the bris even on Shabbos, right? We saw an example of that literally last Shabbos. Why is that so? Why do I desecrate Shabbos to do a bris? Answer, because doing a bris is a positive commandment. 
and doing a positive commandment overrides a negative if there's no other way out. See, this explains actually why is it only an eight-day bris that overrides Shabbos and not a ninth-day bris. In other words, if I'm doing the bris late, I cannot do it on Shabbos. The answer is very simple. Once it's not the eighth day, then doing the mitzvah day nine, day 10, or day 11 is all the same. So there's no need for me to violate Shabbos by doing the bris, because I can do the bris after Shabbos without losing a mitzvah. Masha'en Cain, when Shabbos is the eighth day, there's a special mitzvah of bris on the eighth day. If I don't do that mitzvah, I'm losing that. So as a result, there's no other way I could do the mitzvah of Mila on the eighth day except by desecrating Shabbos. So what do I say? I say, famous rule, I say, Doche lo tasa. Yeah. Um, why do we burn the shofar on Shabbos Rosh Hashanah? Yep, uh, that's a very, very good question. So according to that, why can't I blow a shofar Rosh Hashanah? So the answer is what? So this is an important rule. The rule of Asei Doche Lo Sasa is only when you're transgressing the negative while you're actually doing the positive. So the Chilol Shabbos is the circumcision. With Rosh Hashanah, the fear is I will carry the shofar in the street in order to blow it. That will not allow Asei Doche Lo. You know, you can't transgress now to do the mitzvah later. The mitzvah has to be at the time of the transgression itself, you see? So that's a very good point. That's called ba'idna. Ba'idna means simultaneity. So, here's the Ramban I want to share with you. The Ramban says, why is it so that a positive commandment would override a negative commandment? Maybe we should say they're equal. And if there's equal, shev yal don't do anything. Meaning, I got a mitzvah of bris and I got a sin of Shabbos. I don't know which one is better, don't do anything. Which means you're keeping Shabbos de facto. Why do I say violate Shabbos? So here's what the Ramban says, a fascinating svara. The Ramban says, positive mitzvos are expressions of love of God. Because when you love somebody, you want to do things for them. Negative commandments, don't you dare touch you know, the air conditioner, whatever it would be, that comes out of fear, right? Your father says, you know, don't touch that. Uh, so he says, since Ava Sashem is greater than Yira Sashem, the positive commandments that represents love overrides the negative commandments that represent fear. Either type of fear, Yira Sa'onesh, Yira Sa'onesh, right? Ava is greater than Yira. But there's a very important point that you need to know. Ava is greater than Yira, but Ava must rest on a foundation of Yira. You, you can't say, I'm going to skip the Yira because Ava is the higher level. There's a certain progression you have to go through. And an Ava Sashem that's not connected to Yira Sashem is going to collapse. It's like trying to build a 10th story before you have nine stories, right? There's nothing, there's nothing that's going to hold that story in the air. Yeah? Sometimes I feel like, I mean, it could be like a lacking on our generation. It's a lot easier for people to understand like the concept of love and the concept of fear. Like I feel like to build Yira, I mean, it could be that to build like real Ava in the Yira, that's what you're saying. Yeah. But so hard to yeah, so sometimes we, yeah, yeah, you know, you're, you're right. And indeed, uh, many of uh, the Babacher Rebbe used to say that Aravayda Bismanazah primarily focuses on Ava Sashem because Yira Sashem can break us and make us, make us depressed. So I do think you're right. I think it's Shayach to start with Ava, uh, but then one has to work backwards. Sometimes you have to work backwards, but you can't assume. Yeah, there is a concept of working, uh, working in all directions, but you do have to realize that the Ava that you have without Yira is an ephemeral. I mean, it, it can carry you around for a while, but it's going to dissipate unless it's grounded in a Yira. While you have the Ava, you ground yourself. That's correct, you right. Zero, so. And in fact, that makes a lot of sense because um, if I try Yira without Ava, you know, then I get scared of God and, and I get depressed. 
once I know God loves me, but he holds me accountable, so then it's easier for me to have Yira because I know it's coming out of love. It's not coming out of hatred or whatever. Now, let me just explain the connection between Yira and Ava, because you might think, what do I even mean when I say that Yira is the foundation of Ava? L'chaira, they're two opposite things. So here's the thing. What does it mean, generally, to love God? What, what, why do I love God? Why should I love God? Besides the fact that it's a mitzvah, but you know, why do I love God? There are two different ways you can look at it. You can look at love as an expression of gratitude, meaning one might say, Hashem does so many things for me, my family, my community, the world. He gives us life. He gives us color. He gives us music. He gives us beauty. He gives us the capacity for love. In other words, a person goes through his life and he cultivates gratitude for blessing. And gratitude creates love. When someone is giving to you all the time, you feel a love for them. The love is an expression of hakaras, Hatov. And again, uh, it, could, it could be a personal akaras hatov, it could be communal, it could be world. I look at the world and I see much beauty and much goodness in the world. That's one facet. So one way of looking at it is ava comes from hakaras hatov. And that would include, by the way, hakaras hatov for the love that Hashem has for me. Kamayim apanim apanim. Oh, God loves me so much, I feel a tremendous love for that. That's one aspect of it. The Rambam himself is mashma that there's another aspect of love of God. And that is the inherent love that we have for perfection. Meaning it's not the idea, oh, God has done good things for me. No matter who the me is. Me is me, family, community, world. It's not that God has done good things for me. But the love I have is the contemplation of ultimate beauty and perfection. Now, if you understand that love, the truth is, this is not a contradiction. Both, both ideas are true. But if you understand that love can be rooted in contemplation of perfection, you actually see how there's a very, very strong connection between Yeras Haromamus and Ava. It literally is going to flow. Because if I love God because I look at him like, hey, he's a great roommate who gives me everything I want, that's not going to reach the level of loving the perfection of God. It's only when you're awestruck by that perfection that turns into love, meaning Yeras Aromamas very easily morphs into love in the sense of loving the perfection. For example, I mean, again, we see this in, in, in other contexts. I mean, let's assume you go to the Grand Canyon. I've, I've actually never been there, but this is the way people always describe it. They describe a sense, literally, they use the word awe. They're awestruck. Now, what are they in awe of? I mean, the rocks, I mean, uh, the rocks are just rocks. I mean, uh, what are you in awe of a rock? But your awe in terms of its beauty, in terms of its perfection in some sense, right? So when you contemplate God, even more so. So there's a very close relationship. I wouldn't say Yiras Onesh leads to Ava. It may work the opposite way. In other words, if I'm scared, God's going to hurt me. That's very, very hard to bring you to love of God. Now, the other way around, if you start with love, you then understand the punishments are for your good. So you can move, I think, from Ava to Yerasa Onesh. It's very hard to move from Yerasa Onesh to Ava. Meaning, if your initial mindset is, God's going to hurt me, it's very hard to turn that into love. But as I say, if you know God loves you, you can then understand the role of punishment. So that's a separate thing. But Yiras Haromamus and Ava are very, very, very closely connected. Uh, because Ava has two components. There's the Ava of Akarasatov, and there's the Ava of perfection 
and Shlemus, two dinim in Ava. So we've discussed so far three levels. Yiras HaOnesh, Yiras HaRomamas, Ava Hashem, in the two ways of Ava. But there's actually a fourth level. And that's called Yiras Chet. Yiras Chet. You know, we say in Rosh Chodesh uh, Bracha, Shabbos Mavorchen, we ask Hashem, give us a Chayim, Sheyesh Bahem, Yiras Shamayim, V'yiras Chet. Give us a life where we will have fear of heaven and fear of sin. Now, fear of heaven includes all madregas of year, Yiras Onish, but it's primarily Yiras Aromamas, that we should have awe and reverence for God. What is Yiras Chet? I mean, it's a crazy thing. Fear of God, fear of sin. Is sin God? I mean, obviously, fear of sin cannot be using fear in the same way as fear of God. Because sin is not God. Right? What is Yiras Chet? Answer is this. This is a very profound idea. Yiras Chet is where you reach such a level of love that you are afraid to do anything that will hurt the object of your love. Example. Okay, we'll take a simple example. Let's say you're married, you have to get up very, very early. Your wife is still sleeping. So she's a light sleeper. So you might walk on eggshells, as the expression goes, not to wake her up. You are so afraid you will wake her up. Now how will Yira, your Yare, you will wake her up? Now what are you afraid of? Yirasa Onesh, she'll take a frying pan and hit you on the head? Maybe. <laughs> that might happen. Yirasa Onesh. Yirasa Romamus, I'm in awe of my spouse. No, you don't have that. <laughs> it, it comes out of love. You care about somebody. So you're afraid to do something. You're not afraid of them. See, you're not afraid of them. You're afraid of the misstep. That's the Yiras Chait. The word Chait literally means to miss the mark, miss the target. I'm afraid of doing something wrong, not because I'm afraid of God, but because I love God. See, that's the Chab. Yiras Chait is the highest level of Ava. It's a level of love where the love is so intense that you're literally are shivering, you're shaking. Ay, 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 ay. If this will not make Hashem happy, I'm afraid, I'm distressed, not because God's going to punish me even, but simply because I'm going to hurt. Hashem who loves me. You see? So that's Yeres Shemayim V'Yeres Chay. So it turns out that there are four madregos to consider here. There is Yiras Haonesh. There is Yiras Haromamos. There is Ava Sashem. And the Ava Sashem gets intensified to a Yiras Chet. So some of Farshim learn when it says Vayiru Ames Hashem, that by Kriyas Yamsuf, they feared Hashem. Remember, Kriyas Yamsuf is a miracle of loving kindness. We felt Hashem's love for us. Therefore, we felt a love for Hashem. Right? Mayim upon him upon him. And that love became so intense that we became misyare to do an aver. Was it Yiras Now, look at the diok here. Vayiru ha'am es Hashem. Yudke Vavke. Yudke Vavke is the name of Hashem that we use not for punishment. We use for midas harachamim. So it seems to be a non sequitur. They had yira for yud kevavke. 
Remember, when Avram makes Sarah, or tells Sarah to pretend she is his sister, and Avimelech, the king of the Plishtim, takes her, and Avimelech gets punished. And Hashem comes to Avimelech, and Avimelech says to Avram, why didn't you tell me? So Avram said, Ein yiras elokim b'makam hazeh. This is a place where there's no year of Elohim. Elohim meaning you guys have no fear of God, no fear of punishment even. So you do whatever you want. So that makes sense. Yiras Elohim. What is Yiras Hashem? So Yiras Yudke Vavke is my Yira to hurt Hashem who shows me love and compassion. And that is the Yira that we got by Kriyas Yamsef. Okay, so that's Mazbir. That Vayiru Ames Hashem is not a steer to the idea that Kriyas Yamsef is about love and not Yira, because the Yira in that Pasuk is the Yira of Yiras, of Yiras Chait. Okay? So that's a bit of a Mahalach. Again, all of this is going back to the Tamar Devora, that when you love Hashem, you love B'nai Adam, and you want to do Chesed for B'nai Adam, because you see the world through Hashem's eyes. In Hashem's eyes, everybody counts. Yeah. So when the Midrash says, well, the simplest literal meaning of the Medrash is Yiras Onish. Yeah, for sure. But but I say there are many many other interpretations. Maybe I'll address that uh, tomorrow, a little bit since you raised the question. Okay. Well, have a good day. Thank you for listening to this awesome Ech production. To find out more and to partner in our mission, please visit ohr.edu.